Uh, hey guys, welcome to another week of church. We're going to start our service today by singing praises to our great God. Um, so wherever you are, whatever time it is, um, hope you guys can join with us in our singing. Hi folks, it's uh, great to be with you again. You know, one of the uh, great features of St John's is the, uh, the stained glass windows. At the back of the church to the south, we have some original windows there uh, and the rest have been donated over the years and they are biblical stories in the stained glass windows. The reason why we have stained glass windows, it became popular uh, centuries ago. Uh, the, the beauty of them, the sheer beauty. Uh, they would let in light and at the same time they would provide privacy. But also stained glass windows provided uh, biblical scenes and stories at a, at a time when everyone or most people couldn't read. And so someone would come into church, uh, they would see the stained glass windows and they would reflect and they would, uh, they would pray. Unfortunately, Due to vandalism and the need of repairs, 
Uh, we've had to put uh, some added security, particularly on our east window, which you'll see in a minute. Uh, there is uh, an extra glass there and also steel reinforcing for protection. It is still a beautiful uh, window, uh, uh, but it's a little harder to decipher. Friends, uh, over the years I've been to Notre Dame and it's one of the biggest and greatest and, and most beautiful stained glass windows. Uh, yes, and it did survive the fire. But can I say the uh, Notre Dame is so big and the church is so dark that in comparison to St John's, St John's has a beautiful window that lets in so much light. Uh, it is so magnificent in scale, uh, a, lot, a lot more beautiful than Notre Dame in my opinion. Friends, I've got some information from Peter Hayward that I'd like to share as we look at the eastern window. The east window above the communion table in the chancel was designed and installed in 1874 by Clayton and Bell of England. The transfiguration of Christ is depicted and was given by parishioners and friends as a memorial to James MacArthur who died in 1867. Uh, the window is full of symbolism. The central portion that depicts the transfigured Christ in the tabernacle suggested by Peter, attended by the angels with Moses and the prophet Elijah on his left. And if you look closely, Christ is framed by the Latin in inscription which translate, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. The left panel shows Moses holding the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. And the right panel shows Elijah in his tabernacle with the ravens. Uh, Peter, and, and, uh, Peter, James and John are on their knees at the bottom of the window. At the top of the window is the sacrificial lamb holding a banner, symbolising Christ and the resurrection. And it's the whole idea that Christ is above all. Folks, if you want a more detailed summary of the Eastern Window prepared by Peter Hayward, please uh, see Sarah in the office. Thank you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. As we observe our world today, help us to see your mighty hand at work. We bring our leaders before you, Tony and Debbie, Irfan and Barbara, James and Amy. We ask you to bless them as they faithfully bring your word to our families each week, that they will help us grow in an ever deeper and richer relationship with our Lord and Saviour Jesus. We also bring our staff to you in their important support work. Sarah, Debbie B, Pat, Trish, Jan, Tilda and Haley as we join with them to reach out to our community in a challenging world of opportunities. We ask for wisdom as they preach, as they deal with the wider community concerns. We rejoice with new parents as they are blessed with new lives, with bright futures that you have ordained for them. We also pray for the health and well-being of the mothers who are pregnant and for husbands and perhaps siblings who wait patiently for their family to be richly blessed by the pending arrival of the new birth. We thank you for the many volunteers who assist with the ongoing work at St John's. We pray for those who will be elected at our own business meeting today. We also thank you for the many of our wider community who support those in need through the various community groups and emergency services. We bring Nick and Angela and their teams, leading our small groups each week, helping each of us to grow closer in our walk with the, our Lord Jesus as we learn from your word. We rejoice in the number of women who tune in to Women's Church. We pray for the inspiration and guidance to Debbie and her team as they bring your word into the homes of families who might not otherwise understand your gospel. Bless the women as they hear and study your word each week. Thank you for those involved in men's ministries. We pray for Jimmy and his team 
as they arrange opportunities for men to hear your gospel. We lift up those who faithfully care for those at Carrington. We pray for the leaders and their teams as they reach out to those who are missing the face-to-face -face worship services. We pray for the residents, reassuring them in their faith and comforting them in their infirmities. We pray for their families and friends who have only have limited access to their dear ones. We thank you that the management are following the strict protocols that have been set down by the health department. And we pray for the well-being and protection of the staff from passing on any infection to those they care for each day. We present our request to you, O Lord, and claim your promise that when we ask you anything in your name, you will hear us. Amen. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, the Bible reading comes from James chapter 5 and I'm going to read from verse 13 to 20. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. The gift of speech is an incredible gift. And the greatest way to use our speech is really talking to God, prayer. Prayer is our greatest privilege, our greatest responsibility. And unfortunately, sometimes it can be our greatest failure. James chapter 5 really talks about when should I pray. And firstly, we see, when should I pray? When I'm suffering. Now we read here in verse 13, Is any among you in trouble? Let them pray. So you see, whenever we're in trouble, whenever we are facing hardships or financial problems, maybe relational difficulties, when we're grief, when we have grief, when we're heartbroken, stressed or depressed, Folks, life is made up of problems and to get through those problems, we need God's help. It's interesting, the passage just before um, uh, verse 13, verses 7 to 12, we are told by James we need to be patient in our suffering. Uh, and James cites the prophets and Job who were patient in their troubles in the face of suffering and persecution. You know, it would have been easy for those guys to curse God to complain and grumble. And that's what actually Israel did after God had rescued them uh, from slavery and from, uh, from Egypt. Sometimes Christians can use the mentality of, why me? <laughs> and so we whinge, we moan, we grumble, we complain, we criticise, which in some ways is a great misuse of the tongue in our speech. When we are in trouble, James is saying, pray. <laughs> We need to exercise self-control. It's easy to lash out in anger and curse uh, with malice because uh, we can't control our troubled situation. But prayer can remove suffering if it is God's will. <laughs> but prayer can also give us grace to endure that suffering so that we might achieve his perfect will, which is to be like Jesus. Friends, this is when we need to pray to ask God for patience so that we might remain faithful. And you know what? We come back to that first verse, that first sermon we talked about, 
Consider it pure joy when you face various troubles and trials because it strengthens our faith like a muscle and that leads to perseverance and that leads to being mature in Christ. When do I pray? When I'm suffering. Secondly, when I'm smiling. James says, is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of, of praise. You see, we should not only pray when we're suffering, but also when we are happy, uh, when our lives are causing us to smile from the inside. Then we should pray with thanksgiving and praise. Often when things are going good in our lives, uh, we forget to be thankful, don't we? Folks, prayer is not a psychiatric therapy to make us feel good. It's not all we can do. It's the very best thing we can do. Prayer is an act of faith that is powerfully good for our lives because we were created in the image of God. We were created for relationships. We were, we were created to converse with God, hearing from his word, talking to him in prayer. So it's an opportunity to say, thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for me. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you have given me. Thirdly, we pray when we're, when we're sick. James says in verse 14, Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make that sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. The elders are the mature people in Christ. They are not necessarily people holding office. Uh, we are very uh, fortunate here at St John's that we have wardens, we have uh, parish council and we have staff who are all godly people, who all believe in prayer and they do pray. The anointing of oil was used to set apart by the Holy Spirit in the coronation of kings. And to anoint someone with oil is also to set them apart for sp specific prayers. Oil was also used for medicinal purposes one of the uh, conventional uh, medicines of the day. So we ought to pray to God that God will use conventional medicines or even use his divine interference uh, to bring about healing. Folks, can I say this is not about sensational healing we might see on TV with bright lights and rolling cameras as if it's some sort of show. This is not about saying that God will heal everybody and if he doesn't heal, it's because we haven't got any faith. Huh. Folks, that's, uh, that just produces guilt. It can produce also the idea that God doesn't care. And in some ways, it's arrogance telling God what to do. This is not about people who say God only gave us miracles and healings to the apostles. I think that's a lack of understanding of the power of God today. And this is not about thinking that everything will be okay. You, you often hear people say that. Oh, don't worry, look, things will work out. That just eliminates God. Friends, I wish the words of verse 15 on their own were true. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. On its own, folks, I wish those words are true. But we need to look at all the scriptures. Paul prayed three times because of his thorn in his flesh. And he was given the answer, my grace by the Lord, my grace is sufficient for you. In weakness, you are strong. While Paul was sick, it meant that he had to trust God more and more. You see, it wasn't God's will to heal the Apostle Paul. Nick Vivicek, who is an Australian uh, Christian evangelist with no limbs, he actually says he believes that it's God's plan, it's God's will that he was like that so that he could inspire others who had uh, uh, deformities or, or who had problems or who were in suffering. The prayer offered in faith is trusting in God's ways. It's not necessary, necessarily saying God will heal us, but it is trusting God will always do what's best for us. Folks, can I say, I know people who need healing. I would love them to be healed. I grieve for some of the people that, that are going through tough times. But I also understand God's will sometimes 
God has a bigger plan why he may choose not to heal somebody. I don't understand that. That's where we need to exercise faith. That's where we need to trust God. Faith has no power on its own. It's only powerful because our God is powerful. So the prayer of faith is being confident that God can heal us rather than being confident God will heal us. God is able to heal, but it doesn't necessarily mean he will. And if you go back to chapter 4, verse 15, it talks about God's will, if it is God's will. Regardless, prayer, make it the first port of call, not as your last resort. For Paul, it wasn't God's will that he was healed. Because in his suffering, he was able to do his work with a greater power and a a, a greater strength by trusting in God's grace. Fourthly, we pray when when we've sinned. Verse 15, James says, If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. There is a connection here between suffering, sickness and sin. And we need to remember that we are made up of body, soul and spirit. The body is that part of us that gets physically sick or physically sore. The soul is that part of us, our thinking, our, the, the, the seed of our emotions. And sometimes we might go through mental suffering, damaged emotion. And the spirit is that part of us that connects with God. And any one of body, soul and spirit can affect the other. So if I'm feeling sick physically, it can affect my emotions. It can affect how I think. It even can affect my relationship with Jesus. I don't want to pray. I don't want to read the scriptures. If my emotions have been hurt, it can upset me (laughs) physically, my stomach. There can be an unwillingness to pray. And if I've sinned against the Lord, it also can affect me physically and mentally. The Apostle Paul says in Corinthians, some of you are sick because you have partaken in the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. In other words, Paul is saying some of you are sick because of your sin. Folks, please hear me. (laughs) Please hear me right here. I'm not saying people are sick because of their sin. I'm not saying that, but it could be. More often than not, people are sick for no apparent reason. Confession of sin can sometimes bring physical healing, sometimes emotional healing, but it will always bring spiritual healing. You know, now and then, if people are uh, are, are continually sick, I sometimes ask the question, uh, have you got any unconfessed sin in your life? And I try to encourage them, if they have, that they confess it to God. James is encouraging all of us, if we have sinned against our brother and sister, we need to confess it to God, but that's not the end. (laughs) We, we need to, to confess it to that person we've sinned against, whether we've gossiped or slandered them, whatever we've done. And you know what? It is always God's will. It is always God's will that we confess our sin. It is always God's will that he wants to forgive us and clean us. And that is the greatest healing. That is the greatest healing. Friends, this life is not the end. The greatest healing is being forgiven. And only forgiven people can enter heaven because of the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And in heaven, the Bible says, that's when there'll be perfect healing. No more crying, no more pain, no more sickness, no more death. And finally, when should we pray? When people are straying or when people are wandering away from the truth. Verse 19, my brothers and sisters, if one of you uh, should wander from the truth and someone should bring them back, Uh, In the context, uh, uh, prayer is one of the best ways to keep people from straying. Prayer can bring back people to faith. I'm sure the father of the prodigal son was praying that his son would return, uh, that his son would come to his senses. 
And friends, I know many of you are praying for your kids. I know many of you are praying for your spouse. Keep praying. Ask the Lord that they might come to their senses so that they might open up their hearts to the Lord Jesus. Yes, we should pray. We should pray when we're suffering. We should pray when we're smiling. We should pray when we're sick, when we've sinned. And we should pray for those people who may be straying. Well, who can pray? Well, to keep with all the S's, stock standard regular people, you and me. Uh, Again, let's uh, look what James has to say in verse 16. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crop. Elijah was like us, because he experienced fear, resentment, guilt, anger, loneliness. Uh, He was even depressed to the point of death, we are told. But the great thing we can learn of the story, about the story of Elijah is that you don't have to be perfect to pray, far from it. Here is Elijah. He prayed several times. He was persistent. He would, would not give up. And as a result, it rained a gusher to show the shortfall and lack of power of the other gods, the Baals. God can use ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And James cites Elijah as a righteous man because he loved God. And by and large, he was, in a, he was obedient to God. He was by no means a perfect man, but he was earnest in his prayers to see God honoured. And he was humble enough to repent when he knew he was in error. Friends, that's what a righteous man does. Friends, Prayer is more than just saying pious words. Prayer is from the heart. It's an act of faith. Prayer is not repetitive words, but but heartfelt heartfelt words of honesty and and trust, like a child when it calls their dad, Dad, can you give me this? Dad, thank you for this. Well, how important is your prayer life? I must confess I struggle with this more than any other area in my life. Uh, I find it easier to preach for 20 minutes than to pray for 10 minutes. And yet at the same time, I want to know God in a more deeper level and I want his church to be a people of prayer despite the struggles that we will all have. Prayer will always be tough. It will always be a struggle. It will always be a wrestle. But with discipline... Prayer is worth it for our well-being and the well-being of others. Friends, just a couple of tips before I finish off. You know, just like I eat, I go to the loo, I shower. Folks, think about it. Spiritual discipline, I need to pray. (laughs) I need to read the word of God. Man does not live on bread alone from every word that comes from the mouth of God. We need to pray. We need to listen. If you are not used to praying, start by praying short prayers. Now, you don't run a marathon until you can walk around (laughs) the block. Thirdly, pray while you're walking or driving. Keep your eyes open. Pray whenever whenever you pass St John's. Pray for the staff. Pray for me. Pray for the people of St John's. I know people, when I go for walks, I try to pray for everyone that I know uh, that, that are from St John's. And see prayer not as a duty, but as an honour to enter the presence of God. Just like we talk to a friend, we, we can talk to Jesus, our greatest friend. There's a great verse in Thessalonians that really picks up what we've been talking about. It says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Prayer is our greatest privilege. Don't let it be your greatest failure. Friends, right now, uh, Debbie Bannister is going to talk about when she prays and what she prays. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Tony. I've been asked to say, why do I pray? 
Well, because my relationship with God is so important in my Christian life. And I love spending time with God in prayer. And throughout my prayer, I know I will continue to grow and he will grow me in my faith and my trust and everything in my good times and my bad times. I can pray anywhere, anytime, knowing that God always hears my prayers. As Tony said, anywhere, even when I'm mowing, I know I can pray and I can talk to God and he will hear my prayers. And I know it's his timing and he answers his prayers for the very best for me and for all his children. And I believe in the power of prayer and the best way to have a deeper relationship with God is to have a heart for God, for his word and for praying. And also praying to God and spending time with him, I know pleases him as his child. And what a better way to start the day or to be able to end the day or wherever you find your best time to pray. But that is how I pray and why I pray and spend my time with God. And the other question, why do I, what, what do I pray for? Well, I start off with God's word and it's always important to have God uh, speak to me and um, yeah, just to hear what he wants to say to me for that day. And to praise God, for he is our creator, he is my king and he is my Lord. And the other important thing, as we've looked at through James, is confession. And to come to God with my sins, which I know he already knows, but it's so important to bring them and to confess them to him because I don't want to have that barrier between God and I in our relationship, which is so important. And I know with that, that he hears it and he forgives me when I come with a repentance and sincere heart. And always, I love to give him thanks in all circumstances, but for his forgiveness and for all that he has done by giving me his son, Jesus, who I'm always grateful for and always pray that I won't take for granted that relationship. His unconditional love for myself, my family, my church family, my friends, and how he always meets my needs. He is always there for me and his promises and to never leave me alone. I'm thankful for his grace, the gift of eternal life, and through Jesus' death and resurrection, I have the great hope of heaven and eternal life. And they are so many things more that I could be grateful for. And I'm sure we can all find things to be grateful for. So then we come to the prayer requests, how we can pray for others. And for me, is my family, my church family, my friends, our community, our world, especially at a time like this that we need to come and God wants us all to come to him in prayer. I pray for God's comfort, his strength, and that he'll draw near to not only me, but to those that are suffering physically, and for people that they will come to know Jesus, that those that may be seeking Jesus, especially at a time like this, and for others who have maybe strayed away from the faith, that God will bring them back. And as Tony said again, we all have many family and friends that we want to know Jesus and that we know that have wandered away. But prayer is so powerful and God will answer them in his timing. And also that we all, as God's people, keep strong in our faith, strong in our minds, and know that that relationship is our most important one. And I do ask that God will use me to serve him and to serve others throughout my daily life and for whatever he has in the future for me. Thank you.
Okay, friends, the Bible has uh, mentioned that if anyone is sick, then they should call the elders and pray. And we have the elders here. They uh, represent our staff, uh, faithful people here who, uh, who are prayerful. The Bible talks about anointing you with oil. Uh, and even though we can't do that physically, uh, it's representing that we are setting apart various people for healing. And the prayer offered in faith is knowing that God can heal if it's part of his will. Uh, we're encouraged, like Elijah, to be persistent. Uh, we all die, we know that, but the greatest healing will be when we reach heaven. And so, folks, as we pray, can I say, be praying for not only yourself if you need healing, but for others so, so you can stand or name them on your behalf. So there may be people, some people who are physically need healing, whether it be a blood disorder, a cancer, a heart attack, um, maybe there's arthritis, maybe they've been involved in an accident. Uh, bring those people before the Lord now. Why don't you just uh, name them quietly before the Lord? There may be some people who need emotional healing uh, because they're depressed, uh, the, they're stressed, uh, they have a, a fear or anxiety. Maybe they've experienced uh, uh, grief, abuse. Maybe they have a low self-esteem. If you know people like that, if you're suffering from that, why don't you just whisper their name before the Lord now? And maybe there's need of prayer for those people who are spiritually hurting. Maybe there be... Uh, there are people who have wandered, who have strayed away, as we've talked about uh, uh, today. 
There may be people who have forgiveness issues, can't forgive. Uh, Maybe there's bitterness. With some people, there may be satanic influences that we need to pray against. There may be relational breakdowns with our kids, with our, with our spouse, whatever the case may be. Why don't we name those people before the Lord now? So let us pray. Thank you, our Heavenly Father, for your promise to us that the prayer of faith will enable that sick person to be well, to be restored. Forgive us, Lord, when we doubt your healing power, when we fear coming forward in prayer. Lord, take away any pride we may have and give us a spirit of power to come forward to name those names before you as we lay claim to your healing. And so, our loving Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Saviour. For these servants we have named who have a need of healing, By the blood of Jesus, we bind Satan and his influence in the lives of all these people. We believe that you alone have the power to heal. We ask you now in faith to look with mercy on these, your people, and give healing to those people who are suffering physically, who are suffering emotionally, who are suffering spiritually. Again, we name them before you, Lord. By faith, we affirm that you are now restoring, recovering, whether it be by sight or by faith, we thank you and praise your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, uh, thank you for being with us and uh, keep on praying for your non-Christian friends. Keep on praying for those people who are not well. We're going to close our time together by saying the grace to one another. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you, folks. We'll see you next week.